Hello everybody, I'm Nick and in this video I'm going to show you 5 .NET open source projects that in my opinion deserve more attention. Now this is the second video in this series, I already have one that you can check on the top right corner of your screen right now, but I usually ask you either here or on Twitter, make sure you follow me there as well, which projects with under 1000 stars you like on GitHub and you want me to showcase in this video. So I did that, I evaluated all of them and I think these are the five top ones that you should check out. You know how much I support open source, especially in .NET because that's my platform. So if at any point you think that any of those projects are cool, I'm going to have links in the description, go and give them a star on GitHub, it really means a lot to the creators. If you like the type of content and you want to see more, make sure you subscribe, earning the same notification bell, and for more training, check out nickchapsas.com. And speaking of nickchapsas.com, the first 50 of you who use code OPEN15 on my course's website will get 15% off on any of the offerings. So if you want to buy something with a discount, now is the time. So the first project I want to showcase is called Kokona and it has 525 stars on GitHub. It is a project by Mayuki Sawatari. I hope I pronounced that correct. And it is effectively what minimal APIs are for web API, but for the console. What do I mean by that? Well, let's go ahead and add the project first. So I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to say Kokona. I hope I pronounced the project right. It's a weird project name. Let's just roll with it. So I am installing it and with the project now installed, I can go into the program.cs and I can do the following. If you've ever tried to make any console app in .NET without using any NuGet package, you'd know how painful it is to pass the arguments into an array and then get them out and try to split. And there are packages that do try to make this manageable. In my opinion, this is my new personal favorite when it comes to consoles. Let's say I want to make a console app that simply passes a name and then it uses it into some console print message. So I can say Kokona app dot run and then use the following delegate. So string name, for example, and even, I don't know, int age and then you can say console.write line hi i am and then the name and i am age years old and that's it this is your console app and now watch what happens i'm gonna go to the terminal and if i do dot net run then it will tell me hey you need the option name here it's a required option um so i can say dot net run double hyphen name as a parameter. Let me just new line this. And I'm going to say Nick. And then I can say age and that's 28. And if I just run this and it just prints using these parameters as if they're arguments in this console application, which they are. Now, this is the most basic way to do this. Realistically, you would do something like that though. What I really like about this library is that it's trying to follow the minimal API approach to the T. So what you have in a minimal API and you have the same in Kokona is first a builder. So Kokona app dot create builder, the same way you would have in the minimal API. Then you can have an app. So the app is builder dot build. And in the end, you just run it. And everything looks exactly as a minimal API. I really appreciate that. Now, if I was to register the same command, but in this form, I would say app dot add command, and I can add it and I can say, for example, me, and then have the delegate. So string name int age, where I do the same thing and I have um, a similar phrase. And with this now being a named command, I can go here and I can do the following. I can say .NET run me because I want to use the me command. And I'm going to say name Nick age 28. Same thing. Um, and now I'm getting that message back. But here I can do all the same things I could do if I was using a minimal API, for example, let's say I have some service I want to inject, like an ID generator, because it's very handy for me to have a console utility where I just do new GUID and it spits a GUID in the console, for example, for testing purposes. So I can say something like that and I can simply create a property um, and say ID and this just generates a new ID every time. So uh, it might as well be a method and I can go to the builder same way you would do in the minimal API and say services.add singleton and i would use the id generator here here we go and then i can actually uh, copy this if i want to i don't want to have any uh, argument parameters but i can say id generator here so id generator and it can just spit back a new uh, GUID. so i can say um, id and i can change that to id so if i go back to the console i can clear that and i can now say dot net run id and it just spits back a new GUID. Very, very nice. I highly recommend you check this library out. This is what I'll be using from now on if I want to make console applications. Huge props to the creator. Amazing library. So the next one is more of a utility than a library, but it's called 
Power Up, and it's made by Bartos Adamczewski. Now, what Power Up can do is the following. I'm going to go back to the console because the main project that you're going to be interfacing with here is the Watcher library over here. And this is literally just the code I pulled from Bartos repository. I haven't actually added anything here. Now, I'm personally someone who likes to analyze low level code, see how code is translated, IL code, that sort of thing. And I usually use sharplab.io to check the lowered code or the IL code or anything like that. However, this library allows me to do that in my PC, and I can do it in the following way. I have three types of files, uh, my CS file, where I just write my C sharp, um, an ASM file and an IL file. The ASM will show the JIT ISM instructions, and the IL one will show the intermediate language, how the code is compiled to IL. So I've pulled in my three files, and you can see that they are all empty here. Now, if I go to the console, I can actually run the watcher.exe and point to the CS file, the ASM file, and the IL file. And if I run this, now the watcher is looking at those files. And as I'm writing my C sharp, for example, let's see how uh, a class is translated into IL. So ID generator, the same thing as before. The moment I save, the watcher is actually triggered over here and it writes the IL file and you can see here the uh, IL code for that code and then the JIT ASM file over here. And I can add more. I can go here and I can say uh, prop GUID and I can add a GUID and that will need using system. And then the moment I save, this goes back here and it writes that IL file. I can analyze this code um, and I can see the JIT ASM as well. Now, there's way more things you can do with this library. It's not just you can see the compiled IL than the ASM. You can run benchmarks. You can do all sorts of things just to fit everything in this feed. I'm going to leave it here. However, I highly recommend you check that project and it's very likely I'm going to make a dedicated video because there's quite a lot to talk about here. Now, the next project is the type of project I would personally use on a daily basis just due to the nature of my work and it's called .NET Test Containers. It is made by Andre Hofmeister and currently it has 374 stars on GitHub. Now, why I love this project? Well, I love it because it allows me to interface with Docker through my C Sharp code in a very elegant API, but it also has some pre-configured stuff because this is mostly supposed to be used for testing purposes. And I'm personally using Docker to run my integration tests and in some other scenarios. So this is really, really useful to me. Let me quickly show you. I currently have Docker running over here, as you can see, and I have no containers running, just the Docker engine. And I can go here and I can install the .NET containers project over here and I can install it quickly like that and look how easy it is to run and then discard a container. I can just delete that and I can say builder equals new test container builder. Here we go. And I'm going to use the test containers container. That's a bit of a weird name, but let's move on. And I can simply specify that I want with image and the image I'm going to go with is the Docker getting started website. So Docker getting started. Then I'm going to give it a name. So with name, my demo, there we go. And then I can specify the port binding. So with port binding, and I can simply say 80 here, who cares? And then I can actually have a waiting strategy. So the code will not move unless some condition is true, which is really helpful when you're waiting for a container to be ready. So I can simply say with wait strategy and I can say wait for Unix container. And there's many conditions. All I want to say is until port is available, and I'm going to say 80 here and that's it. Now, all I need to do is say await using var test containers equals builder dot build. Here we go. Then await test containers dot start async to actually start the container. And then at that point, the container should be ready and I can do anything I want with it. So for example, I can fire an HTTP request. So new HTTP client dot get async. And I'm going to say HTTP. It should be localhost and then a port 80. I mean, that's the default, but who cares? And I'm going to just await that. So let's stick a breakpoint here and let's just run it and debug it and see what happens. So currently you can see I have nothing in Docker. Nothing is running, no container. Uh, if I step over this, this will create the definition. I'm going to press build and we have the test container and still nothing here. And if I step over the start async, it's going to wait for a bit. And then as you can see here, my demo is running. This is my Docker container. All good. Now, what's awesome here is let me show you if I can say here task dot delay and delay it for five seconds, for example, and I don't need to debug it here to show you this, but 
Uh, the container doesn't exist anymore, it was automatically disposed. And if I run this and go back here, you can see how the code will start. It's going to wait for five seconds and then the app will exit. And as the app is exiting, the container will be disposed automatically because this is using a using statement. It's a very nice API design and I really, really like this. There's so many things you can do and I think that's going to be my new go-to for Docker-related interfacing. But let me show you what makes it even greater than this. I'm going to go ahead and comment this out in case you want to grab the source code for this project and I'm going to create a new builder. So I'm going to say var builder equals new test test containers builder. But this time I'm going to use the Redis test container because built into it, the creator has actually added Redis, Postgres, all the major, like very common things you might want to spin up as part of your testing approach is already built in here and it gives you access to the actual service and connection strings right out of the get-go. Let me show you. So I can say with name, and this is just demo Redis, and then with database, this is awesome, new Redis test container configuration. And I'm just gonna use the default one. And that's it, all I need to do now is say await using var test containers equals builder dot build. And that's it. Now I'm gonna go ahead and start it. And since we're using Redis, we might as well add the stack exchange.redis library here and actually call this thing just to show you how it all comes together without me actually having to do anything complicated. So first we need to await the start and then we need a connection multiplexer. And to start that, I need a connection multiplexer dot connect. It could be connect async as well. And I usually hear you have the connection string, but the library has built in support for that from the configuration. So I can simply say test containers dot connection string. And it handles that for me. I don't need to do anything. So now I can just get access to the database so multiplexer dot get database goes here and then i can simply database dot string set async and the key is i don't know random number sure it can be anything um here we go uh, and then we can actually get it so we can say value equals await database dot string get async and then again the key is random number so we might as well and let's just add a fake thing here so the thing just doesn't exit automatically so let's go ahead and debug this as you can see nothing up my sleeve nothing is running i'm gonna go ahead and run this and i'm gonna start the container the container has started here you can see redis running i can step over this grab a connection i can set a string uh, and then step over that and I can get the value from the database. And the moment I am out of here, which I can do by pressing enter here, the database is still running, uh, but enter automatically disposed. This is awesome. I really, really, really like this library. Props to the creator. Give it a star. Now, the next library in our list is called reg extract, and it has to do with the bane of my existence. And that is regex or regex or whatever you want to call it, it doesn't matter. It's a very small library made by Scott Blomquist, but I really, really like how it eliminates a lot of the code you'd have to write to extract something from a string using regex. It only has 29 stars, but after I show you what this does, make sure you go and give it a star. It's a really nice little project, which is still being developed. So let me show you an example here. I have something like this. I have a phrase, oh, something happened at a given uh, date today, in fact. Um, and because I have no idea how I can do this in a more elegant way, this is the pattern, the regex pattern I want to use to extract that phrase. Now, normally you would write something like this. There might be a better way to handle this, but usually the way you would do this is you would run some code like this and you would make sure that you actually pass something, check the groups and get the value that matched the regex you wrote. And as you can see, I'm getting the date out of this um, as an object, because this is also important. I want to get it as a date only object. I don't want to get it as a string because I might want to do some manipulation or anything. It doesn't matter. It's mapped to an object. That's the important thing. Now, if I go ahead and I go to NuGet and I say reg extract and I install this package, watch what I can do. I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to comment out this nonsense and I'm simply going to say var date only equals the phrase I want to extract from and then extract and I can use a generic type here, so date only, which will also do the mapping to the object. And I'm going to say regex pattern. And that's it. And now I can simply 
uh, print it out. In fact, let me just debug this real quick. And just in that line, I have my object properly mapped. This is it. This is the library. You can do this sort of extraction with anything you want as long as it's mappable. There are other types of objects you can map to. You can check them in the GitHub page. I highly recommend you give it a star so Scott extends it even further. It's really, really nice and very, very convenient. I really like this. And last but certainly not least, we have units.net, an awesome library by Andreas Galberg Larsson. As the name implies, units.net makes your life so much easier when you're working with units, which is usually a pain in where you don't want to have a pain. Let me show you what it does. I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to add the units.net library over here. I'm going to install it. And now let's say I have something like that. I have miles and then I can say length, nice struct over here from miles. And I can have a length from miles, in this case, 60 miles. Um, and I want to know because I'm Greek, how much that is in kilometers, which is what we use back home. So to do that, I would normally have to go and look up a formula and then do some calculations. But here I can just do console.writeline miles dot and there's all these units you can convert to. It even has hands, which who uses hands as a, anyway, my point is you can do kilometers here and I can simply just run and print that is a hundred. Wait, it's not a hundred kilometers per hour, right? Turns out my whole life is a lie. 60 miles is that and not a hundred kilometers per hour. Well, cool. But this doesn't stop here. You can do tons of things with this library. It really depends on whether you need to do that, but it really helps when you need to do internationalization. This was the 15 take to get the word right, but it really helps when you need to do international. <laughs> but if you want to do these conversions for your business use case, this is awesome. And you can do other stuff too, because of all the operators behind the scenes, you can have things like uh, arithmetic uh, calculations here. Uh, you can divide by uh, a length and it all works and you can add to different lengths as well and it all works fine and you can go even further especially if you're working with things like acceleration speed velocity there's many things that this library can do for you like the following now will you need something like that well you might but when the time comes for me to do something like that this library will be there for me it is awesome i highly recommend you give it a star there's just so much value in this small little nice library well, those are all the libraries, but if you have any libraries with less than a thousand stars that are related to .NET and you want me to review to include in a future video like this, please leave a comment either down below, but do not link it. Use the GitHub username and then the project name, because if you link it, YouTube will just remove it or even better, follow me on Twitter and then send me a DM and I'm going to take a look at it. Well, that's all I had for you for this video. Thank you very much for watching. Special thanks to my Patreons for making this video possible. If you want to support me as well, you're going to find a link in the description down below. Leave a like if you like this video, subscribe for more content like it, turning the bell as well, and I'll see you in the next video. Keep coding.